Okay, it looks like we're live. Welcome everyone and uh, thank you all so much for joining our panel today. We're very excited uh, to start our panel discussion. And first, a big thank you to the wonderful people at Reviewer Credits uh, for organizing this talk and for uh, assembling this fantastic panel of experts. Uh, my name is Scott and I'm uh, with Edon's Learning Lab as is my colleague, uh, Gareth. And we're gonna meet all of our panelists first and find out a little bit about them and to see how peer review and identity relates to the work that they do. So first, let's introduce our panel and find out some more about them. We're gonna start with uh, Irache. Irache, tell us a little bit about your background, a bit about yourself and how peer review plays into your, your experience and your work. So thank you so much for the opportunity to participate today. It's always great to be part of Peer Review Week. Uh, I'm Irache Puebla, Associate Director at uh, ASAP Bio. We are a nonprofit who have a mission to advance innovation and transparency in life sciences communication. So we work on different areas, but one specific area of focus for us is to drive transparency in peer review in whichever form peer review takes place so within journals and beyond. Uh, a little bit about me first, I guess. Uh, before uh, working at ASAP Bio, I worked in publishing for 16 years. I was part of the editorial team initially of the BMC series of journals. Um, and then later I moved to PLOS where I was part of the editorial team of the journal PLOS One. So I spent a lot of time either coordinating the peer review process for the journals or reading reviews of our scene, editorial decisions, etc. And also I, I, I was involved in developing editorial policies, including also related to the peer review process. I also want to mention, to again, to give the full context of my perspective here today, that I'm a member of the peer review committee at TIS, which is the European Association of Science Editors. So in terms, very briefly, in terms of where peer review comes into my work, as I mentioned, for a number of years, I was involved with uh, peer review at journals. So I've been quite interested in this space for, for a number of years, particularly around innovation in peer review. I've worked in journals, as it happens for me, um, initially in the BMC series uh, at journals that run different models of peer review, but also including open peer review when it was a relatively new thing. Uh, then when I was at PLOS, I was part of the team that implemented transparent peer review. And by transparent peer review, I mean the publication of the reports, not necessarily the names of the reviews, but publishing the peer review reports uh, with the articles. So I've been following data space at journals for a number of years. And now more recently, my role at ASAP Bio, something that we are quite interested in, quite interested in is supporting peer review in the context of preprints, which as many of you will know are co uh, copies of papers that are posted publicly without peer review, but that doesn't mean that you cannot peer review them. There are a lot of initiatives, some of them community driven, some uh, organized by services and platforms around providing evaluation of those preprints. And we are trying to uh, run a number of initiatives to uh, foster that type of participation and also try to make a case for the benefits of posting those reviews publicly because obviously as preprints have not been peer reviewed prior to posting, it really adds to those papers. But maybe I'll talk a little bit more about our initiatives as part of the discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you so much Irache and thanks for making time to join us today. Uh, next up, we have Flaminio. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Flaminio, and your experience and how peer review plays into your work. Yeah, thank you, Scott. And, and again, thank you to um, Reviewer Credits for, for having me here and inviting me here. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm Flaminio. I'm from, from the University of Milan. My background is in sociology. Um, um, I am here, especially because I have chaired a quite large-scale um, project on peer review, um, which was uh, entitled PURI, which was a cost action funded by, by the European Commission. And, and the, uh, we put together quite large-scale collaboration between academics, researchers interested in studying peer review and uh, stakeholders, including especially publishers, uh, interested to uh, explore the possibility of sharing data on, from internal journals to the, to the community. And this project was run from 2014 to 2018. And we reached a scale of something like about 260 academics and professionals working together in five years. So it was really an amazing experience. And, and so, um, but I also, um, 
I developed an interest in, in peer review, especially coming from my background in uh, sociology, but especially my background in experimental behavioral research. And so I always study how to set up uh, rewards and incentives to promote cooperation between people. And it seems to me that the uh, theme or, I mean, the topic of, of identity and re rewards and recognition, how to promote also more transparent peer review is very, is very close to this. And as uh, Irata was saying, I also an interest about this kind of open peer review. And I have collaborated in, with Alsevier in assessing the uh, open peer review trial. And so we have a paper in which um, Alsevier gave us data uh, on five journals which shifted from closed peer review to open peer review at the same time. So we got data uh, estimating the behavioral referees before when peer review was uh, uh, closed and confidential to uh, uh, during the pilot in which uh, the system shifted to open peer review. And we published this paper last a uh, couple of years ago and it was a very nice exercise. So we got data, great data from the publisher, and we ran our analysis and we found that, you know, there's a, a Obviously, more you know, pros and cons. It's difficult, but it's possible. And we found, I mean, a lot of interesting things that we might probably be interested to discuss uh, uh, today. Fantastic! Thank you so much, Felinio, and thanks for making time to join us and join our panel today. And over here is uh, my colleague from Edans, uh, Dr. Gareth Dyke. Uh, Gareth, tell us a little bit about yourself and how peer review plays into your experience. Yeah, it's great to be here, and it's great to see you on a on a slightly different webinar platform, Scott. So yes, I mean that's um, I'm uh, Gareth. I'm a geologist, a paleontologist in my background. So um, I published lots of papers and dealt with the peer review process as an author a lot um, over the course of my academic career. Also performing peer review for colleagues and for journals like all the time. So I'm very interested in recognition for researchers who perform peer review and, and how much time and energy they put into that process, often um, without the kind of recognition that they feel that, that they should get. But I also have an editorial perspective because for 17 years now, I know um, I've been working with Taylor and Francis, um, editing a journal called Historical Biology. And so um, we manage submissions and we often struggle um, because our field, our research field is quite small and we don't have like a huge pool of researchers to draw from, um, how to find reviewers, how to increase diversity in our pool of reviewers, and how to get early career researchers in particular interested in doing peer review, um, both for their own experience and as a transferable skill, which is something that we've talked about a lot um, in our EDANCE training, and I hope that we'll have the chance to talk about again today. So thanks to Reviewer Credits for the chance to participate. Great. Thank you, Gareth. And yes, big thanks to the whole Reviewer Credits team for organizing this. And uh, they're secretly working behind the scenes to take your questions out there, everyone who's listening. So please uh, don't be shy and be ready to post your questions anytime. We will stop uh, at least twice a day to take Q&A uh, from all of you. So don't be shy. Send your questions in. The Reviewer Credits team will uh, gather and compile your questions and promote them up to us uh, for our panel to discuss. So feel free to launch your questions in at any time. Um, we have two general topics perhaps to talk about today. And the first topic is this intersection between peer review and identity. So my first question for the panel is, I'd like to ask each panelist about your interpretation of this, the theme of peer review week this year, and more generally, this idea of peer review and identity and how and where they intersect. So we'll start with Irache. Um, Irache, tell us a little bit about, about your perception of the intersection between peer review and identity. So, and I find this a fascinating topic because I think it applies to so many things in, in our personal and professional lives. Um, the way I've been um, thinking about this is that for me, uh, identity is really a multi-layer topic. Um, and I tend to think about this in the context of uh, what does identity mean for me? It's essentially, it tells others which uh, communities I'm part of, is the groups that I consider myself as belonging to. 
So there are a number of factors that can fit into this. And I tend to think about identities in plural in the sense that we will often have different backgrounds and experiences in our, again, personal and professional lives that will fit into this. We are obviously part, as a scholars, part of the uh, community of researchers in that discipline, but then we are also part of other different groups according to our gender identity, for example, our race, perhaps our geographical or uh, cultural background. So I think this makes for quite a complex and also fascinating uh, mix because when we think about the peer review process, at least in my experience at journals, for example, there were several elements of those identities that were coming um, uh, to the fore very quickly. For example, when you're looking for a reviewer, obviously you want someone who is an expert in a particular uh, domain of research. So the, their discipline and their line of research comes up very quickly. That's something that you need to consider when you're matching a paper to a reviewer. You may also want to bring in some diversity for geographical location, for example. But there are some other elements of the reviewer identity um, that may be much more personal and nuanced. Again, things like our gender identity and, and how do we see ourselves within certain racial groups. That's not something that maybe immediately obvious for editors when they are searching a reviewer, so that it's necessarily easy to quantify. Essentially, I'm not saying that editors don't think about this, they do, and they are making a lot of effort in trying to ensure diversity and inclusion. This is that they, they are perhaps more personal and subjective elements, which are perhaps more difficult to, again, take into account or quantify in a very straightforward manner. And in the context of all this, I guess that for me, and again, from my introduction, you, you, it, this may not surprise you. Um, I would like to make a case for transparency in all of this, because I think that when we have, again, these identities where some of the elements are so personal to our own experiences, it can be, again, very difficult to bring those to the pool of reviewers and to the individual evaluations, unless we have some transparency as to who is involved in that process. We all have, uh, again, all our biases that we bring to all our activities and peer review is not an exception. And by this, again, I'm not criticizing the fact that we have biases, it's just a fact of life. We all have our own biases, conscious uh, or unconscious. But I think that by bringing more transparency as to uh, how we are approaching the, the, the review process, we are providing further context for our evaluation and enriching it and also allowing others to make better um, I guess, uh, I'm not going to say yes, but you know, to, to interpret our evaluation in a more broader way that if we keep our identities hidden. Great, thank you, Irache. Um, I'm going to pose the same question to our other panelists, and Irache uh, raised some fantastic points there. Uh, for example, the ideas of, of the sheer complexity uh, of the issue and also cultural um, indicators and obviously our tendency towards bias and Irache has made, made a case for transparency. So let me pose the same question to Flaminio. Um, what's your perception of the intersection between peer review and identity and, and any points you'd like to address in what Irache just mentioned about cultural bias and yeah. diversity? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, and, and thank you, Irache, especially for uh, mentioning um, the multidimensional concepts of identities. And, uh, for instance, today, you know, and among my n number of identities, uh, today I, I'm instantiating or I'm required to instantiate my identity as expert in peer review, which is something that probably in other communities I feel to belong or I involved that it's something completely relevant. So there's another instance of my n identities, which are you know, uh, um, uh, uh, implemented or, 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 or ask it that requirement. So and this is a very good point about this kind of identity, is plural. And um, I would like to add so, um, that um, I, I, I come from a field which is sociology um, in which this intersection has been always seen as problematic. And um, there's a recent paper by a sociologist, Barry Merrigan, published in which um, this colleague uh, reconstructed the history of the, um, the way the American Sociological Association in the U.S., which is the largest uh, association worldwide for, uh, in my field, I mean, uh, uh, managed uh, peer review and all the editorial tasks 
uh, of uh, the European Beer Medical Society Association journals, which are quite very representative in the, in the, in the field of sociology. And uh, if you read all the notes of the meetings of the editors uh, and, uh, and experts of the, of the SA, since from the beginning, it's been from, the, from, the, from the 50s of the last century, the concept of protecting the identity of the referee was really considered as important, as well as protecting the identity of the other Sumitri Magistrate. So the idea was the identity, uh, revealing identity, having information about uh, characteristic of identity of authors and referee could bias uh, judgment, the independence of judgment. So I come from a field in which double blind peer review is considered as a, as a you know, the, the best kind of model, more appropriate model. And so the question of identity was always seen as, uh, I say, a problematic. On the other end, I see the point that uh, um, one of the most important challenges uh, for the sustainability of peer review is about uh, how to find ways to recognize the effort of reviewers. And so this is an intersection in which obviously the question of identity is uh, uh, of the referee is quite important. I mean, uh, it's difficult to recognize the work of identity, uh, of the work of a referee uh, without, you know, linking referee reports or this kind of stuff with, with an individual. And so this kind of identity issue uh, um, comes back to the, to, to the picture. I do believe that this kind of intersection is interesting, is problematic, uh, as also Yaratu was, was saying, and sometimes um, so we need to think about how to protect uh, individuals from the risk of being, you know, associated with certain kind of uh, identity categories, which are sometimes also problematic or which can influence um, the process. So we need to find intelligent ways in which we can find, you know, a good way to manage the process of peer review in all these different kind of entity, preprints, journals, funding agency, whatever in a way that uh, we avoid exactly to, you know, incorporate either consciously or not possible sources of bias or possible source of violence in, in, in the identity definition from the point of view of journals or as uh, part of the community. So it's an interesting intersection, still something that requires a lot of research and, and, uh, and in how to, to, to find a good, you know, trade-off between recognition, rewarding and protecting people from a certain type of information that they probably might consider problematic to them. Great, thanks Felina for that excellent answer. And who better than a sociologist to talk about some of the problematic aspects of peer review. Uh, we'll, we'll turn the question over to my colleague Gareth here. We've heard some interesting terms from Irache and from Flaminio, terms like problematic, uh, yeah. terms like uh, protection, and so on. What's your take on this intersection between peer review and identity, Gareth? It's really interesting. And I have some anecdotes. I haven't got any research, but I've got some anecdotes from my own experience to bring to this, I, I hope. Like, I think choice is really important, like both for journal editors on the one hand, but also much more importantly for reviewers and for authors, like um, double blind we know is, is often preferred by certain groups of people and other groups of people prefer their work and their reviews to be completely open and transparent. Like we've encountered lots of reviewers who say, I always sign my reviews. I don't ever do a review that's um, anonymous, um, but authors may want that or reviewers may want that. I mean, I remember a situation when I was still um, a postdoc and I got a paper to review from Nature in our particular subject area, written by some quite senior colleagues, um, you know, one of whom was, you know, somebody I ended up going on to work for like a few years later. At the time, I didn't know that I would go on to work for this person. Um, but I was like, I was reading the paper. I was very honored to get the paper for review from this prestigious journal. But at the time I didn't want, I wouldn't have wanted my name to be on the review because I didn't have good things really to say about the paper. So, I mean, that's something that we have to take into account as well. While transparency and openness are of course, great aspirations for everyone to, to, to aim for, like there are of course many situations where you'd want to get your name on a review as a reviewer and you'd want potentially not to put your name on a review as a reviewer and the same for authors. So I think identity 
fundamentally important, but also the concept of choice about how you reveal and project your identity is also is also critically important for the for the effectiveness of the peer review process. So I hope that I hope that helps. I mean, yeah, great questions though. Thank you. Great, thanks, Garrett. So we have some interesting themes here today, themes of diversity, themes of, of bias, some intrinsic bias, and how to work with these problematic issues. Maybe this is a good time to take a look at our Twitter poll. So we did ask a question on Twitter. We asked your opinion. Uh, and the question is, does recognition strengthen peer reviewer identities? The theme of our talk today. And our respondents said 64.3% in the positive yes, very. 14.3% of our respondents said a bit. 7.1% said not at all. And 14.3% said, I don't think about it. So same question to our panel. Does recognition strengthen peer reviewer identity. We've heard about ideas of transparency, bias, and so on. Let's put it to our panel. We'll start with Flaminio this time. Does recognition strengthen peer reviewer identity? What's your take? Yes, um, yes. My take, I, I was thinking when, when, when Garth was, was uh, uh, remember about his experience with this kind of reviewing a, a paper in nature. And um, one of the main findings of our assessment of the open peer review trial uh, five journals from Elsevier, which has been published a couple of years ago, was that uh, we found this int intriguing point, which might probably be in line with what Gareth was, was saying, is that at, at the end of the day, we found that only 8.1% of referees in these five journals agreed on signing or having their name on the report. And uh, the majority of these 8.1% of referees agreeing on that uh, were recommending to accept the paper or only minor revisions. So, and uh, this is a this is a problem. I mean, this reveals that probably there is a tension, and there is this kind of need for a choice, as Gareth was was saying. And so, probably, um, the, the link between recognition and identity is problematic, obviously. But um, I do believe that it's also very context discipline uh, specific. For instance, I. I I would be surprised to have these discussions about recognition and identity in a conference of social scientists. So I, this is, for instance, among social scientists, this is not a problem. So they, um, they, we see this kind of two concepts as very separate. So we, need, we see a lot of reasons why to disentangling the, the recognition systems, how to recognize referees for their effort, and the question of the identity of the referee. So we, we see a lot of reasons. So it's still probably unclear how to, you know, uh, um, streamline this recognition platforms, recognition tools with this kind of identity. And I will be very much supportive of the Gareth, um, and also you actually was saying, about it as a good reason not to endorse any draconian uh, solution, any mandatory solution, my understanding, any mandatory, any draconian, any one fits all type of systems for in peer review uh, uh, will be a, mis a dramatic mistake, a reduction of possibilities and opportunities, and sometimes even a violence to the tradition of certain fields. So we still need to go on discussing and debating this kind of issue and clarifying and finding counter specific type of solution. Right. Although lots of publishers, or at least some publishers, do have those kinds of guidelines, like, um, for example, some publishers don't allow authors to select or suggest peer reviewers for their own papers anymore. So there are guidelines, maybe more to do with the ethical side of this than identity, but we do need some guidelines, right? So to add to that, I, I, I just wanted to mention perhaps something that um, uh, can help us initial steps to try to bridge the gap again between recognition and whether um, specific reviews are comfortable sharing their identity, because I totally agree with what has been raised here. There are very understandable and tangible concerns by certain groups about providing critical reviews and having their name attached to it if they are reviewing for an author who is in a position of power compared to them, according to, again, career stage or other potential factors. So, I think that's something that we certainly need to take into account. 
um, uh, because we don't want, obviously, any participation in peer review uh, to lead to negative uh, consequences for those who are contributing their time for this activity. But I think something that can help, again, try to bring that recognition um, while allowing a certain level of um, ensuring that those identities are taken into consideration when, when we assign this, this recognition to the peer review activity are a couple of things that are taking place. And I'll talk one about what journals and other services are doing and then something specific that ASA Bio is, is trialing that I wanted to mention in case that's of, of use. Um, there are a number of journals who are happy to act as the, I guess, the party that would act as a validating step for the uh, activity of the peer reviewers. So they will, will have journals who are happy to transfer information about review activities to services such as reviewer credits, for example. So it is them who are vouching for the fact that this person contributed their time and their expertise to this review. Um, ORCID, for example, has a similar process, so any researcher can add this to the ORCID profile if the journal has that, that system. It's very easy. The reviewer just needs to say, I'm happy for this to go to my ORCID. Anyone can get an ORCID for free. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of building your, uh, I guess, review activity profile, and with that, again, reinforcement, reinforcing your, your identity. Another way of doing this that doesn't necessarily need to involve journals is uh, you could also uh, post your reviews publicly. Um, and if you don't want your name associated with it, again, you can find somebody, maybe your supervisor can act as the person who is the validating uh, actor here who can post this and I'm posting on behalf of a colleague or something like that. Um, at Ace of Bio right now, the approach that we have taken for an initiative that we have around preprint review is that we have a trial ongoing where we developed um, a system to have a group of, uh, they are mostly early career researchers who contribute comments on preprints in a private space. So they can only see the identity of each other in that group, since it is not available to the public. But then once they have finalized the commenting on a paper, what we do on our side is facilitate that to be synthesized into a single report that will be posted publicly with the list of names of the commenters, which means that they can still say, I contributed this review, but no one can link exactly what the comment was, if it was a positive one, if it has a more critical one, et cetera. So that's a very concrete way for them to say, it was me who contributed, but no one can essentially fault them for a specific comment. So I think we may be able to find other innovative ways of trying to bridge this gap, again, between the identity and transparency and the recognition element. Great, thank you, Rache. And thanks to everyone for your answers to that question. We have some questions from the audience to get to next. So questions for our panel. This is a question from Bianca. What if we link instead the work of a referee to their reputation in the scientific community? What does our panel think about that? We'll start with Gareth. Any thoughts on that? Um, I think that's a bit problematic, actually, because um, just because somebody has a big reputation in a particular field doesn't mean that they're going to do a good review of this particular piece of work. I mean, often you find that the big professors, the big cheeses in particular fields, they're the busiest researchers and they don't put the time and energy into their reviews. We get lots of reviews back that just say, great paper, accept it, or <laughs> the worst paper I've ever seen, reject it immediately. Often it's early career researchers, people with perhaps less of a reputation in a particular field who do a better job of reviewing papers. So often what editors are looking for actually is a mixture, like, you know, two or three reviews, um, but, you know, maybe one from a senior researcher and, you know, some more information from younger researchers to get that balance about papers. So, you know, linking to reputation, I'm not sure I would, I'm not sure I would put much weight on that um, in the case of individual articles assessed for publication would be my view on that. Great, thanks, Garrett. And Bianca's uh, a couple of details added to her question here. It sounds like she's suggesting a kind of a, an anonymous system that rather than a specific identity, it focuses on their achievements and metrics. A any thoughts on 
Well, related to this question, uh, for the panel, any thoughts on how we're moving forward as an industry with some innovations like this? We do have organizations like Reviewer Credits and um, uh, Publons, and we mentioned ORCID earlier. Let me ask the panel, uh, and this relates to Bianca's question, are we moving forward as an industry in improving these kinds of systems of, of recognition for peer reviewers? I'll pose this question to Irache next. Yeah, and I, th I think that um, we are making some progress on this element of recognizing peer review is in my time, at least in both in life, sci in life sciences communication it's always been there. Um, I think we are making progress in the sense that researchers have now some platforms available to themselves to again, build their um, reviewer profiles and kind of their portfolio of review activity in a way that they can easily again linked to uh, and and so others so again we have reviewer credits pablons and as i mentioned orchid uh, also incorporates review activity i think that the important thing here and 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 as i understand that the service is running we are moving in that direction is to make this as easy as possible for the reviewer because obviously they've already spent quite a few hours reading the paper writing the reports and you know navigating the Re uh, manuscript handling platforms and what you want is to make it very easy for them to be able to claim uh, credit for for that activity so i think that we are making progress in that direction the other thing that i would like to perhaps see more in the future is as i mentioned perhaps more integration with also other review activities that are taking place again for example around preprints but also others i mean there is feedback, feedback that takes place on methodological papers protocols data etc so try, try to integrate more the different re, uh, peer review activities that they don't only need to take place in the context uh, of journals and i think that will also bring more i guess control to the researchers themselves as to how they want to again build their portfolio and present that so related to what gareth was mentioning about the choice so perhaps giving them more tools so that they can shape that as they think it fits for for themselves great thank you Irache. And a related question, uh, unless anyone else on the panel would like to chime in on that question, I wanted to ask a related question. So uh, in terms of recognition, if someone is thinking about becoming a peer reviewer, they might be asking, why would I want to become a peer reviewer? What, you know, sorry to put it in these kinds of plain terms, but you know, what can I get out of becoming a peer reviewer? I'm not going to make any money out of this. So what are some of the incentives? You mentioned, Gareth, earlier that it's difficult to find qualified peer reviewers or even less qualified peer reviewers. What's the incentive? How do you convince someone to want to become a peer reviewer? I'll put this question to Flam first, and then we'll put it around to the panel. Uh, what is the incentive for someone to, to get involved as a peer reviewer? We'll, we'll ask Flam first. Yes, Scott, that's a very, very important question, and I like that, that, that you directed to me, so I'm passionate about this kind of topic. Yeah, that, that's, there is research about why people review, so why why scholars uh, review, and uh, typically there's a list of reasons, including uh, learning. Uh, so, you know, the, that's, that is a problem in, in the scientific community, is that you always, you know, change and progress and and, and, and and you also need to understand you know to see what others are doing and you learn a lot from from, from understanding what others are doing and uh, and we also need as academics some self assurance that we are doing good we are doing our research as you know these meetings on ours which are shared in a, in a community and obviously reviewing other paper a papers is one of the most important sources of learning about, about what, what is going on and uh, and this is very important in, in, in our eyes. And the second is obviously this, this idea that uh, becoming a researcher, a scholar, is entering in a community. And, uh, and community is not just a set of resources that you can use and supply or exchange, but it's also a set of values and, 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 and social norms that, that uh, we all agree. And, and, and so there's also, you know, the fact that if you know that whenever you submit a paper to a journal, you will get back you know, comments and and remarks and suggestions by anonymous reviewers, and you probably appreciate with a secret back whenever you are required to. And reciprocity, you know, is one of the most uh, 
universal ingredients of any form of social life. And so there are also this kind of uh, uh, component. But obviously, the question is that uh, uh, um, there's a lot of deficiencies and problems in peer review, and it's obviously the situation is not, you know, neither optimal, neither super great. So there's a lot of problems in, in, in peer review, and you need to find a way to make it more sustainable, more efficient, and, and so on. And now there's a lot of discussions about uh, the type of rewards that we can use. And uh, for instance, some journals, especially, and you will not be surprised to, to, to realize, especially in economics, uh, they try to use material incentives, so the pay reviewers, either cash for, for, for the reports, uh, $100, for instance, or with some benefits like you know, downloading books or downloading materials from free from the publisher. And, uh, and obviously, and this, another option is about reputation. So, you know, the fact that uh, if you do a great job, you know, and you can put in your CV and this kind of uh, your uh, effort as a reviewer will be, you know, part of, of, the, of the assessment or part of the reputation that you're building as a good academic. So, again, uh, in some fields, people are to say, I mean, I, I'm not a fan of material incentives also because, I mean, this can escalate. Uh, and so we don't have a price mechanism. So there's no, it's, it's really an imperfect market peer review. And so there's no demand, a demand and supply and an efficient pricing mechanism. So starting to pay reviewers, it, it's really, I mean, what, what is the, you know, the margins? What, what is the threshold uh, in which uh, people are sensitive to this kind of material? How much should we pay? And uh, it can be homogeneous. You can pay fixed everybody or, you know, full professor more. Junior level, so it's really something there's no um, so market price to function requires a, a kind of information system, quite you know, rules and this kind of stuff, requiring infrastructure that we don't have. So, I'm a fan of reputational mechanisms, but I do agree that uh, also, uh, for instance, creating metrics, uh, as it was suggested before, metrics measuring you know our contribution as authors our H index, our R index or reviewer, is something that could be a streamlining this. A number of metrics is something that could be problematic. We are typically seeing a lot of problems about using quantitative metrics in assessing uh, system and individuals. So it's, it's really something, something. I do believe, and I'm closing here, just taking too much time. I do believe that uh, this is the reason why probably we still need journals. We still need the organizations like journals with editors and boards, which are, in my understanding, a, a, a great identity, a great position, a great uh, 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 in which this problem can be managed more intelligently, more adaptively, depending on the field and the context. And so this is why, for instance, I, I'm not a fan of the idea of destroying journals. Journals are still very important for, for them, even probably for peer review and for managing recognition mm -hmm. systems. Great, thank you for the, for the great answer, Flaminio. And I think we need to have a whole other panel about uh, the need for journals, about preprints, uh, other things we talked about today. We could have 10 more panels, I think. So I'm looking forward to those. Uh, I wanted to pose the same question to Gareth because I know this is something you feel passionate about. Flaminio mentioned um, reputation as being a, a key incentive for peer review. Um, also the learning aspect. Now I've heard yeah. you say, Gareth, in our events that peer review is a transferable skill yeah. What do you mean when you say that peer review is a transferable skill? Yeah, oh, that's a great, um, yeah. I mean, why should you do peer review? Like, what's in it for you? Like, people always say things like, oh, you're going to contribute to the field. You're going to, you know, help. But from a very selfish career development perspective, we know that lots of young researchers may not stay in academia. They may not end up working full-time in academia, large proportions, in fact, depending on the country, depending on the region. But peer review is one of the key skills that you will learn or have the opportunity to learn, depending on where you're based, depending on where you work, because lots of universities don't provide this kind of training. You're just expected to learn on the job, like, you know, learn from your supervisor, your research group. But imagine in the future, if your boss gives you a document to comment on, and you're able to comment on that document in a positive, constructive, meaningful way, rather than a negative, destructive way, which is the way that most people approach the peer review process, I think. Most people think, how can I stop this paper from getting published, rather than how can I help these authors to get their paper published? So I think the biggest benefit, from my perspective at least, why should you do peer review? Why should you engage with 
training that publishers provide, that companies like Edance provide, is to help you gain this key skill that will be really, really useful in future work, whatever that work ends up being. So yeah, I'd say that if somebody asked me like, why should I do peer review, you know? I mean, also from a purely selfish perspective as an academic, you get to interact directly with editors, which in some cases, high impact factor journals can be very, very useful. So if you've done a review for The Lancet, for example, science, and you've done a good job, the editor appreciates your time and effort, you've got that personal line of communication then for your next paper um, with that editor. You can make that pre-submission inquiry. You can nudge your own work like a little bit further ahead in the line. So there's a there's a selfish reason for you and a and a altruistic reason. There. So great question there. Great, thank you, Gareth. And now from some of our audience members, here are some more um, excellent questions. This is from Mary. Mary asks, "Do you see a time where we will see professional peer reviewers?" I'll put this question to Irache first. Professional peer reviewers? Yeah, so that's an interesting question because it can be interpreted in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if we are thinking about this in the terms in terms of a specialization of peer review, I think we're already seeing some of that. Uh, in my previous role, for example, we, we had certain processes to specifically search for reviewers with a statistical expertise, for example, which in certain disciplines is very, very important to make sure that you bring into the process. And we were doing this for um, clinically focused papers that could, well, the, the, the results could have an impact for public health. Um, so from that perspective, I think that we are going to see further specialization of the activities because research is becoming more and more complex and more collaborative and more multidisciplinary and can we expect really one or two people needs to cover all of the potential aspects of a research project involving perhaps a hundred authors and five years of work i think that's not a very um easy expectation to have if the question here relates to the payment aspect or essentially people who are on the payroll who just do this full time i'm not so convinced that we will move uh, um, into that direction, partly for the reasons I was just outlining, that I think we're going to have to see more different perspectives in terms of, again, uh, discipline expertise, but other perspectives into the evaluation. And because there are many complexities into the potential aspect of, again, the payment, uh, if you are doing this for uh, a living, for example, you're probably not doing so much research. So are you keeping up with the latest results in the field to provide an informed decision? You know, that's a possible question that comes up. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested in hearing what the others think about the professional peer review aspect. Great, thank you, Irache. Here's another audience question from Selvi. Is there a merit assessment for peer reviewers for their voluntary work in reviewing manuscripts. Let's pose this question to Flam. Any thoughts on Selvi's question, Flam? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting question about, um, uh, we are discussing a lot how to, you know, use this kind of signal to try to increase, you know, the commitment of referees by saying, so okay, they can use that kind of assessment um, in, in that. Unfortunately, no. Um, at the moment. So uh, what I know is that um, some journals are using internal metrics to try to uh, estimate or measure the performance of commitment of, of internal referees. And for instance, I, I'm editor of a journal and I, and I also develop an internal ranking and, and we also published this kind of ranking in a, in a paper some years ago and uh, it's called F3 index. And uh, three index, and so I use this to screen, you know, among the sample of my of the uh, my journals uh, uh, reviewers, and to spot, I mean, certain type of, of performance, and to uh, and I use this to reward uh, the top performing reviewers, and uh, using this as a rule for the editorial turnover. So I invited uh, after this assessment, uh, the I just concentrated on the top twenty. And uh, if the, uh, there were new names among the top 20 best performing reviewers who were not members of the board, I used this information to suggest to the, to the board, 
about it to, to invite them, to co-op them on board. And so this is a possible use, but it's again internal to the journal. Whereas I don't know um, uh, any, if not really, you know, the fact that you can put in your CV some of these kind of metrics like the, your, your index on Pablos and this kind of stuff, or the fact that you review for, you know, prestigious journals or prestigious funding agency, you can use it in, and in job competition, perhaps you're lucky enough to find a committee who is not obsessive uh, only from H index, and also look at the fact that they are hiring a human being, which is not only an H index, but is someone who is also supposed to cooperate, to have cooperated, to, to give benefit to others, to be, to be. And so you, you could be lucky to have a committee. Uh, but obviously we need to pressure, make pressures also to find an agency uh, and in making this kind of signal more important during the, uh, the uh, assessment. So even only, you know, you know this kind of nudge idea, just only adding, you know, among the requirements that you only don't put your best five publication or your age index or this kind of things, but you also put, you know, you know, information about your activity as reviewers and people will start to read the scene as something that could be probably relevant and important and it's something that probably could be done. Thanks so, so much, Flamingo. And yes, question from Teresa, could you repeat that, that index name? The F, F3 index, F3 index has been published in a paper in 2019 in a journal of informatics. Uh, you can use my name and you find a, you find a paper. Thank you. Great, thanks Flamingo and thanks for asking. And a final question, um, this is also from Selby. What would be your take home message for the next generation of peer reviewers to help shape an efficient and unbiased scholarly ecosystem. Oh, that's a big question to finish with. This one's for you, Gareth. Great question, Selby. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it relates to what Flam was just saying. I mean, when we sit, or when I used to sit on, on, on job assessment panels, like um, we didn't care about what papers you'd reviewed for and what your Publon score was. We cared about where you published your papers and what your H index is. So my answer to this question, um, and it's a really great question, when young people and young researchers get into more senior positions at universities and research councils, we need to change the assessment process by which academics are evaluated. And until that happens, like, unfortunately, the culture is such in many countries um, that this kind of recognition, this kind of um, score, how good you are as a reviewer, what journals you review for, is just not considered all that important by panels of academics who are assessing you for jobs and grants and things like that, I'm sorry to say. So, you know, that would be my comment on that is, you know, as you move up the academic ladder, like, you know, let's work to try to change the system. And this is this has to come from publishers as well. But what's really needed here is is um is is academics to to you know and universities and and, and government policymakers to look at different ways to assess academic performance, I would say. So if if I may add to Sally, so that the I, I totally empathize with that. So the the, the, the answer is that is the new generation of peer review who have to change <laughs> the academy. We are waiting, we are waiting for, for it. And change does not require regulation for so it's change of individuals. You can make a lot of difference whenever you are in a position of job or evaluate or assess someone else to use this kind of your criteria and to make intelligent and multidimensional and comprehensive global um, evaluation process and without just looking at a single indicator. That's a very good, got it. Very well done. Totally doors. Thank you, Flam. Any final comments from our excellent panel? And by the way, thank you all so much for making the time today. This has been really fascinating. In fact, I'm already mentally thinking about the next five or 10 panels that, that we could do together. It would be very exciting. I hope we get the chance to do this again. But thank you all very much, Irache, Flam, Gareth. Thank you all so much for making the time today to, to share your expertise. And a big thanks to the reviewer credits team, also uh, to Angelo and Elena and team. Thanks so much for organizing this. It's been really fun. And I look forward to the next one with our expert panel. Ah, here's Angelo. Hello, Angelo. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participation at this interesting panel. Thank you. Thank you for all the reviewer credits team.
You're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks, and stay safe. Thank you.